three-part series of reflections on the theme adaptability and digital transformation. This week, we will feature recent graduates of the Caribbean School of Media and Communication, CARMAC, who work in a variety of fields across the Caribbean. I am the panel moderator, Alpha Obika. This event is part of the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series staged by the Faculty of Humanities and Education here at the University of the West Indies Mona campus. The panelists will discuss the topic preparing for media careers in the future. As current employees and workers in the constantly changing field of media and communications, these recent graduates will explore issues pertinent to the industry and reveal challenges that must be overcome to function optimally. So today we have a diverse panel from across the Caribbean. Let me first introduce Cleon John. He's a Caribbean filmmaker and founder of Twin Island Cinema, a film production, promotion, and talent development company. He is also a creative director of Open Initiative, a multinational content development and marketing agency based in St. Kitts and Nevis. Mr. John graduated from Caramac in 2011 with a Bachelor of Arts in Media and Communication specializing in public relations. Our next panelist is Joe Van Johnson. He is an award-winning journalist with almost 10 years experience in the profession. He is currently a senior reporter at the Jamaica Gleaner. The 2012 Caramac graduate is the founding president of the Caramac Student Society. He was a 2017 Shevening Scholar and completed an MSc in Development Management at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Mr. Johnson has taught media and journalism at Caramac and the University of Technology, Jamaica. Our next panelist is Christina Taylor. She's a 2018 graduate who majored in digital media production. She currently works as a graphic designer and digital communications teacher in Surinam. Her most recent, recently completed project involved the design and illustration of an upcoming publication on Caribbean Black empowerment. Ms. Taylor strives to perform at the intersection of creative aesthetics and a purpose to design great work. Next, we have Dana Lynn Swaby. She is a communication practitioner with over five years experience managing the communication portfolio for local and regional climate change projects. She has been a representative at the United Nations Youth Climate Summit, COP25 Climate Change Conference, and the Shevening Cup. The 2014 Caramac graduate is a 2019 Shevening Scholar pursuing an MA in Global Communication and Development at Loughborough University. Pamela Diaz. She holds a BA in Integrated Marketing Communication from Caramac. After graduating in 2017, Ms. Diaz worked in various media and communication companies. She is currently the owner of Communication and Event Planning Agency in Nevis and is also employed at the Nevis Air and Seaports Authority as their marketing and communication manager. Rinaldo Marchalek is a 2019 Caramac graduate of the Bachelor of Fine Arts in Animation. While at UWE, he worked as master rigger of the animation team that created the Jafta Propeller award-winning short Agui. He was also the charter president of the Digital Media and Animation Network Club, Demand. Mr. Marchalek has been associated with media houses as an intern writer and is currently contracted as an animator at a local television station. And our final panelist is Kishmar Shepard. He graduated from Caramac in 2013 with a BA in Media and Communication, specializing in television production. He was assistant director on the Jamaican television show, Island Rockers. He has written, directed, and shot several of his own short films, which have been featured in the Kingston On The Edge Film Festival. 
Mr. Shepard is the founder of New Visual Media, which has produced content across the Caribbean for organizations, uh, including the UN, Caribbean Development Bank, and the SAGICOR. So there we have our panelists with a diverse range of skill sets coming from different year groups who reside in different parts of the Caribbean. So we encourage the audience to utilize the chat feature uh, of the YouTube feed, indicate your name, your question, and give your comments. And you can also shout out some of the panelists um, that you may be familiar with. And feel free to ask those hard-hitting questions that we will um, answer towards the end. We do have chat room monitors who, once you type your questions, will feed them to us. So let me get right into the panel discussion. We're talking about preparing for media careers in the future, but it feels like almost every citizen, every company has been thrusted into a scenario where they have to function remotely, where they have to get access to the technology, and they have to be able to utilize these digital platforms to function. Now, before, it was a scenario where you saw public sector and private sector seeking to transform themselves digitally, but now it seems like we as individuals have also had to make those changes. My first question to Jovan Johnson is adaptability and digital transformation. What is it and how are the two related? Uh, thank you, Alpha. Um, uh, hello to the panelists. Really good to be with such a distinguished group of panelists um, who are gradu graduates of, of, of Carimac. And I think it's a very timely topic as well, uh, given what's happening now, which we can't ignore, but it sort of, it sort of uh, allows us to zoom in really on, what, on adaptability, for example. But first, my understanding, and at the very basic level, I want I understand digital transformation to be sort of a process of change, um, driven, of course, by digital technologies, um, whether, whether, they're, whether it's, uh, it involves business processes, um, customer-driven um, efforts to, to boost your, the, the, the customer experience, uh, whatever it is, whether by institutions. But it really doesn't stop just, just there. It, it, go, it permeates society. It, it, it involves all of our activities, all of the different units that make up society. And then of course, adaptability, of course, which is, so th there's this, this process of change. Uh, adaptability then anchors it in the sense that we have to be able to respond individually, uh, whether as a family, whether as a, as a church, whether as a, as a school, at a university, a government, whatever it is, all units of society have to respond in some way. And you, and it, 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 it's uh, just to be uh, maybe sort of controversial or, or, or so on. If you are not able to respond to the changes, is it really transformation? Is there really transformation if a people or, a, or an institution or whatever it is can't uh, respond and respond perhaps positively to the change? That is to remain relevant, to, to, be, to be needed, to still offer those kinds of services that will keep you... Um, Will keep you keep you in surviving, uh, and of course, as a journalist, I'm, I, I contend with that every day um, because I work in a largely print uh, print journalism industry, and we have had to adapt, respond to the changes in the technology in in, in journalism, yeah. and how those professions. Um, well, let me go back. Mark, I was introduced to the concept of media much long before I came. But I found that that was Karimak's institutional response to provide uh, skills-ready uh, uh, students, journalists, media practitioners for the industry. And it's not just for the industry, it's for the society itself. But if, we're gonna, if, if, if we just look at that, look at it from that level alone, Karabakh had to change his programs, change his courses. I think, I believe I did, my program was media and communication. And I think I was the last batch that did that media and communication program. And what it morphed into or, or transformed into, uh, let me use that term, was a program where you no longer had to, you no longer specialize in one area of, or one skill area of, 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 of journalism. I did radio, for example. Now people, you have to do radio and uh, online journalism and television and all of those things. Because when you go into the newsroom, as I have, 
you have to contend with uh, with a with a profession that requires you to uh, to to manifest or to to, to work with different technologies uh, that are not necessarily in silos as they used to before decades ago, and so. One of the other things I also want to introduce in, 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 how, in, our, in how we understand digital transformation and adaptability is the importance of cultural change, because that strikes at the heart of behavior and human interaction with the supposedly, um, you know, inanimate, inanimate sort of uh, processes. How do people respond? How can people respond? And what are the hindrances to people responding appropriately? to what digital technology, new latest trends in, 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 in technology. And I'll just point to one before, I, before, I, before I, 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 I give up my time. When you look at the, how technology is distributed across the country, the technological architecture across, across, the, across the country, who has access to technology and how are they able to adapt? And if you are not able to adapt fast enough, how far behind are you left? And then, when you look at the macro picture, then you then you begin to see you, you begin to you begin to find problems. Whether it's through education, whether it's through camera can report and the levels at which it gets students, and when students go out there, how are they exposed, and how how does that feed into the learning into the learning process? So it's a complicated process of change, with, which requires a, a response from the different parts of society, which is not always fair or equitable. But you get the feeling that technology. Definitely, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about the issue of equity and access a little later on. But I know that you are well positioned, uh, uh, being at the Gleaner, seeing the changes and the transformations that that institution has had to make in order to remain relevant and to remain as one of the, the market leaders in media and communication across the Caribbean, but particularly in Jamaica. So I hope to, to get some more insights yes. from you, but I want to shift now to uh, Serena and hear from Christina, who studied digital media production to get a sense from you, uh, how do you see adaptability and digital transformation being related? Okay, thank you, Alpha, for your question. So I would say to build off of what Jovan said, in my eyes, digital transformation, it really just goes beyond the digitization and the digitalization of our world. I mean, there is a difference between the two because digital transformation is a complete shift of our digital landscape as, as we know it to be now. So I would want to incorporate two words, the personalization of the digital world we live in now and the integration of the technologies in our daily life. I mean, technology is a big part of our life as we know it today. I'm talking about phone apps everywhere for e-commerce, e-banking, e-government systems, surveillance systems, 4G, 5G networks, everything is being incorporated into our lives. And I'll speak about how that affects our adaptability later on. So the transformation, it has modified our existing businesses, it has modified our existing cultures, and it's also modified our customer experiences as well as our user experiences because we play a big role in the transformation. Now, in terms of the transformation, I would say there are positives and negatives that a lot of people choose to brush over. I mean, it's all good, but they're also the negative sides of digital transformation. Um, security issues, both physical and digital, so for the users and for their devices, privacy infringements, as well as psychological and social problems are a part of the digital transformation. But within my field, I would say that the digital transformation has created a high demand for content. Because what I'm noticing in the Caribbean now is we are all transitioning over, as well as in Suriname. So everything is becoming digitalized. It's becoming electronic. And when it comes to adaptability, Javon did say that there are, he said that it doesn't matter how far behind you get left. I wanted to say that nobody will get left behind. 
everybody has to be on board on this digital transformation because every single platform you use in the future, in near future, will be digital or already is digital. So adaptability to me involves the ability to learn and comprehend new technology with confidence and without fear. So when I'm creating designs for users who are over the ages of 45, I would say there is this fear of, but if you build me a website, I don't know how to use it. And I'll say, okay, we'll learn. We'll learn how to use it. And in Suriname now, our digital landscape is expanding because we now have nationwide data and digital broadcasting coverage. There's the e-government system with the personal identification now in play. We have e-commerce, e-banking, digital wallet services. There is now a city safe surveillance system and it's, it's growing, it's getting larger. Not to mention the increased demand for distance learning. So in our field, we are met with the need to create the content that these platforms will show. It's more than just the algorithm. It's now what will the people see? I love the optimism that I hear when you speak as somebody who's a content creator. <laughs> I want to pose the same question to another content creator, somebody who makes short films and has directed a number of, of them successfully. Uh, operating out in Barbados, Kishmar. What, what do you have to, to say about adaptability and digital transformation? You can unmute. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, I, I was so intently listening to what uh, Jovan and Christina were saying because I, I totally agree. This digital transformation that we're experiencing right now is, is very multifaceted. And it has permeated all factors of our life. When you think about um, recently PlayStation released the PS5 and that was a big thing online. And so in how we work, in how we interact and in how we play, technology has completely transformed um, all of those platforms. And we as, we as um, regional societies, we have, to, we have to focus very heavily on adaptability uh, because this digital landscape, like Jovan correctly pointed out, it won't be positive for everyone immediately. Some people will have a hard time adapting when you look at the, um, the distribution of, of resources and wealth uh, and social, um, the social constructs. Um, the, those in the lower ends of the social scale, those often get left behind. And with this digital transformation, we have to be very careful not to leave persons behind, but to, to, to find ways to bring everyone on board. And uh, recently, um, as I'm sure you guys are experiencing in, in Jamaica, governments, regional governments have made a strong emphasis to digitize themselves and to, to put themselves into, into that digital space in terms of uh, paying your taxes online, in terms of um, getting information and forms from the government, because we have been, um, we have been forced to, to, to distance ourselves and to do things differently. And I see this as an opportunity for us to envision uh, a new Caribbean lands, a new Caribbean digital landscape where we not only um, live and work, but also interact with each other digitally. And I think that that has a lot of, uh, a lot of positive potential in terms of more collaboration and, and more innovation and really um, thinking of new ways to adapt to this new digital landscape that we're going to be experiencing. So I, I, I as, a, as a content creator, we've had to adapt. And I, I'm very pleased to say that um, here in Barbados, in the visual media, we've been able to, to provide innovative solutions to our clients and our clientele. And, and I think that, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So when, whenever there's a need, then that's when people start putting their heads together and start thinking of new solutions. And that's where the adaptability comes in. Thank you, Kishmar. The, as you were speaking, I got quite excited as a Caribbean man myself. When you refer to the new Caribbean digital landscape, I mean, I hope these are the things that are being discussed by the heads of government when they meet, because there's so much opportunity that um, the digital space allows for um, countries like ours, and especially for us who are, who are content creators, people who are involved in news, etc., cetera, um, to be able to capitalize and exploit these opportunities. So um, as I 
as I ask that first question, I'm looking at my chat and I'm seeing a number of persons from across the Caribbean um, engaged in the chat room. Feel free to continue to identify yourself and where you're from and also to pose those questions that we will address at the end. Now, as you were speaking initially, it came to mind what in order to make some of these adaptations, um, there's a certain amount of training that is needed. Some of us have it, some of us don't. Many of us have had to make these changes. And I, when I say us, I speak generally, have had to work from home, have had to become teachers at home in this very trying time um, where many of us have not been able to go physically to, to work. So social distancing has become the new norm. But it makes me wonder that since um, in, the next, in the coming months, we may not go back to that standard, traditional face-to-face -face interaction that citizens in general need to equip themselves um, with skills to function optimally. My next question to Cleon, who's operating out in St. Kitts, um, explain the new digital learning landscape. And what does it mean for media and communication workers? So feel free to speak to the general population in terms of the skills in general, but also the media and communication worker specifically. Cleon. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is such an exciting topic. I, I, I love the fact that the first two um, speakers mentioned culture because I think that, I think that the biggest learning opportunity has to do with culture more than tech. So uh, technology and most of the technology that we use for communication is pretty easy and intuitive to learn, right? But I'm seeing that um, uh, from a cultural standpoint, you know, uh, we talk about working from home. Working from home is an entirely new paradigm for a lot of people in the Caribbean. It's something that we've always wanted internally. Everybody kind of wants to work from home. They want to be comfortable. They want this. But um, a lot of my colleagues and stuff were not accustomed to working from home. Um, and we're seeing this also in, 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 in the classroom, in, in, in some of the, the schools that are here. Uh, is that persons are having major challenges in, in maintaining just their focus, their discipline, um, their accountability, um, their productivity. So we're having, to, we're having to find new ways of measuring those things. So I think that um, in addition to, yes, we have to onboard a whole bunch of new digital skills, we have to onboard a new type of work ethic as well. And not just a work ethic, but also ways of measuring productivity, which is something that I've always um, uh, posed difficult questions to, especially for business owners. Right. I know from my from my own uh, standpoint, you know, <laughs> I, I, I have a few very productive hours in a day. Right. Maybe four or five solid productive hours in a day. And in that in that in those hours, I can do a whole lot. Right. And what I found is having to go out less, having to deal with less traffic, less sitting in meetings, less less hot sun, all that kind of stuff it drains your energy much less and you're able to sort of focus much more and um, put more into the work that you have right in front of you if you're able to, to develop new means of focusing, right? And then of course with employers, um, new conversations need to be had about how do we measure work output and productivity. A lot of, a lot of employers, a lot of workplaces, you know, it's if you show up on time, if you're late, if you're sitting in the chair, that kind of thing. But no, you can't do that. No, the only thing you can really measure is whether you did the work or not, <laughs> right? Um, and how well you did it. And, and in doing so, how were you able to collaborate? Um, no, there's no excuse for, for a lack of research, um, for instance. So we're seeing those kinds of changes coming out in, in, in terms of productivity. So, so definitely it's not just a tech um, learning curve. Right? Our working relationships are also changing because now when we are building teams for different projects, um, we have to include that digital aspect because 
We know meetings are going to need to happen online. We know we're going to have to do Zoom calls. We know we're going to need MITS from UA to come in and help us on that kind of thing. You're going to have to be a huge part of, of every process. You know, I could imagine the team, the technical team at UA is probably like so, um, so much they have that their workload has probably tripled and, and quadrupled by now um, because having to facilitate all of these things now. So, so the digital um, or digital like our tech professionals are having to be a major part of our teams now. Um, so that's a major thing as well uh, that we're seeing. Media professionals, yeah, of course. I, I think that uh, media professionals by nature, certainly, you know, any any media professional that's come out of Carmack uh, already has that adaptability built in. You know, uh, our our program sort of trains us to be able to apply our skills and knowledge in any kind of area. So, so we're able to pick up different things. I'm having to learn how to edit videos, which is something I've never had to do before, but simply because so much is now taking place, so much is now, is now on camera. Um, the way you communicate, the way you, you publish, the way you um, uh, 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 communicate with your clients and all that kind of stuff. So how do you brand? How do you edit? All that kind of thing. You have to kind of learn how to do that stuff yourself too. So that's a major thing that we're seeing. How do you promote and market yourself? That's that's different. You can't. You're not. There are no more cocktails. There are no more marketing networking cocktails and that kind of thing. So how do you how do you appropriately network right with your peers and your colleagues? Um, and what new sort of protocols need to come out of that? I think we're I think we're learning those things, um, sort of intrinsically. I've been calling this whole new thing like the new frontier of of regional integration. Because look at this screen right now, right? This screen, I mean, this Zoom call is made up of people from all over the region, and certainly so many of my meetings and that kind of thing have been looking that way. And I think that one of the great things that's coming out of it is that. Um, Caribbean people are now having to learn how to work together across countries even more, right? And like, I think that's one of the, that's one of the positives. Um, we're learning more about our culture, I think, as well. You know, when, you, when, you, when I scroll down my timeline on Instagram or on Facebook, it looks totally different than it looked uh, a few months ago. I mean, people are still posting up and people are still doing memes. I mean, pretty, but you're inside of people's homes much more now. So we're seeing more of the home life of Caribbean people, I think, um, naturally with this new, with this new sort of digital landscape, right? So, so that's another thing that we're seeing. Um, well, definitely, let me interject at this point because you've said a lot for us to start to think about. And while we are speaking in many terms about technology, I like that you've introduced that there needs to be a cultural change. Uh, a change in our mindsets and the way we operate. Um, I also love that there's some balance to what the panel has said. I'm looking at the I'm looking at the chat on YouTube, and I see where someone mentioned that there are challenges for persons who have to work at home but have kids. Um, what about those who have to train the kids but never really use the technology? Um, have never really sent an email, much less to be able to use. Uh, Photoshop, etc. So there are multiple challenges that have been posed that there needs to be at all levels a cultural shift. Um, so that's a very good point. And additionally, you you discussed, you mentioned that there needs to be a new type of conversation about the output. Um, I wanna I wanna ask Pamela to respond to to what you have said and also to. Give us our own take on this whole uh, digital learning landscape and the skills we need. You can unmute your mic. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Obika. I was actually very antsy as Cleon was talking, especially when he started talking about culture. I was like, preach, <laughs> because and I'm gonna take culture a little bit further because you're actually in my sister island. But here in Nevis, culture as it relates to digital transformation, it rough, <laughs> it rough because 
And I want to what I want to say is that because of the current state that we are in and everything is so digital, you have to change everybody's mindset and everybody's behavior. And we all know that that is the most difficult thing that you can actually do. So I actually read an article a couple of weeks ago, like around the time that Corona COVID-19 had started. And it said that the students are currently using an app that is available via Flow. And it was an app that was already available for usage for students years ago that is being implemented now. And I was like, why did we not do this before? So I, for Nevis people, I find for Nevisions, it is, ex, it is a very difficult change to go through. It is very difficult for you to tell us to stay home and work, especially as the commentator said, one of the commenters said that sometimes you have children at home and sometimes home is filled with so many distractions. For me personally, staying at home and working was the most difficult thing that I ever had to do because... I can't do anything at home, but I feel like for creatives, people in in people like in graphic designers, because when I was at UWE, I experienced the most culturally diverse area that you possibly could, because everybody came from different places. But if it's one thing everybody who has been to Caramac can attest to is that persons who do the DMP program, the digital media production program, they are not regular people their hours are different. <laughs> so people who are creative, you can't always tell them, go to work at eight, finish at four, and this is the hour within you work for, which is exactly what Cleon is saying. Sometimes creativity strikes you and productivity strikes you differently. And now that is bringing that to light. So a lot of socioeconomic issues that people have are being brought to light because now everybody going through this digital transformation, now you have to bear in mind the person's culture when you tell them to work from home and you have to bear in mind that, yes, you're working from home, how productive are you? Because now the job says you're working from home, but are you actually doing the work? So now you have to produce. And another thing that I think that this is doing for people in the media, you have to be extra creative now, just as, Cleon was saying that now you have to think outside of the box because like you have to mash up the box and do something else because now you don't have print. Normally an event would have gone well for promotion, like hosting any type of event, whether it be a cocktail or something small, you know, anything. And now you can't do that because you can't really go out, social distancing, masks. You have to start considering hygiene. So it's a little bit more difficult. So what does that do? It forces us as creatives, as media practitioners, to tap into that creativity that already exists. But because we were conditioned to go to school and go to work, and this is what you're doing, because you are in your safe zone and you're in your comfort zone, you can only achieve so much. But this has now put you in a position where you're like, I really need to do extra, I need to do more, I have to be different, especially because it's digital transformation and everybody's doing something. You don't only have to think creatively for yourself to promote yourself, you have to think creatively because I don't wanna do the same thing exactly that Cleon is doing if we're in the same industry. What makes me different from Cleon? How is it that I am going to set myself apart from anybody especially for yourself if you have a company that you run for your clients and for people who have jobs that are nine to fives or eight to fours you want to be able to set your company and your employer as well as yourself apart so it really forces you to tap into that level of creativity so i think that between culture and getting people's behavior to change and creativity it's really causing us to push more and be more and do more. Definitely. So thanks very much for getting, for painting that complete picture of St. Kitts and Nevis out there in the Eastern Caribbean that I'm sure is a re reality relevant to some of the other countries. But I want to ask uh, this question to someone who's currently studying at Loughborough University. Um, 
Dana Lynn Swaby, what is your take as someone who is upgrading her skills, a Shevening scholar doing quite well out in the UK, and you're experiencing the adaptability of a so-called modern society. Um, what are some of those skills that we need? Uh, okay, thank you, Alpha. That's the last part of that question is a bit broad, but I'm happy that you went there with that question. And I, before I get to that, I have to acknowledge what my other colleagues had mentioned before. I remember Jovan saying something about it being a complicated process of change. And I think that's really where we are right now. And Cleon mentioned something about Karamak graduates having the adaptability built in. And I reflect on my Karamak experience being a part of the first cohort within the integrated marketing communication program. And we were referred so playfully as the guinea pigs of the program but we're happy that the experiment was successful <laughs> because i i recall when we had um we had a special in social marketing public relations and advertising and we also had media production where we were also exposed to radio tv and graphic design and i remember myself i think okay i'm just gonna be relegated to content i'll just be fine with the writing and even though I dabbled with the other offerings I, I didn't see myself fully immersing but fast forward to 2019 2020 and I recognize that no I have to pull on those same skills I have a podcast so those that radio editing skills that I learned I have to pull on that right now and you know I'm also dabbling into video editing and all of that so I, I recognize that the foundation was laid and I think it is an example of transformation, institutional transformation, recognizing that you have to prepare or provide degree programs that correspond with the needs of society and, and the kind of change that we are expected as, as people to make in different industries that we're going to occupy. Um, on the level of adaptability, I compare my current UK experience and I saw that happening right after the transition with this great equalizer, the big C um, <laughs> that, that is now, has now affected us. And I realized it's so interesting, adaptability versus digital transformation makes you view the academic experience differently. And especially for prospective students, because I was drawn to Loughborough when I, when I went on the website and I saw the physical space and the state of the art technology and the classroom. And I recognized that it's located in the home of the 2012 Olympics. And that was appealing to me. But now with everything constantly changing and the rapid adoption and distance learning was a thing before um, this current phase you now realize that prospective students are not going to be drawn to what the school has to offer you physically and what the classroom environment is about. Because even at Caramac, we have pride of, pride of place as being one of the foremost institutions in media and communication. But right now the competition landscape is also changing because students and people who are looking to enroll are now gonna compare how well uh, is the online delivery, the virtual learning environment, what is that like? And so you may have the, the, the very awesome learning experience in the physical setting, but how does that transition? And I think a lot of institutions are now looking at the mirror to say, how can we expand our offerings and the processes? So I think even from that perspective as a student, I've been comparing that. There are some struggles, I mean, realizing that staring at a slide I, I recall very distinctly having to sit for two hours to stare at a presentation with six slides that's torturous in comparison to another class that was an online that, that had um live video and interaction with, with breakout rooms and all of that so i think it's a it's a constantly developing scenario and you recognize that the goalpost is, is it moves further as it relates to how competitive institutions are or need to be and what it means for the student that occupies that environment. I remember when we were preoccupied with how do we manage the transition from students to the working world and you're expecting to go out in the world to be trained. No, you recognize that you have the tools and the resources at your fingertips to upskill yourself so where we had the concern that we may not be getting all we need even at the master's level now i recognize there are, there are some elements of the learning process because doing a master's 
in global communication and development. I'm, I'm very much immersed in theory, but because I had work experience coming into this space, I am also concerned about the practical output. What happens when I am engaging with stakeholders? And that was my reality before. I am more the social sustainable element of, of the conversation, having worked in climate change and also having to engage with audiences who are located in rural communities. So when we're speaking about this whole digital environment and realm, you have persons who are not really immersed in that reality as yet. I heard my colleagues speaking about culture. That also needs to happen because of the confidence when people engage with certain technology. And um, pulling it back, um, I'm recognizing how is it that I manage this transition? We have the resources that are that are at our fingertips, a LinkedIn Learning, a Udemy, there's Coursera and so many other opportunities that while I am immersed in the theory and dialoguing with, with a lot of scholarly and academic contribution, I also have the opportunity to upskill so that when I made that transition, it's not as if I'm trying to find my bearings once more. So I know that there's a lot of things to think about how we establish ourselves and how we stay ahead of the curve in this era of rapid transformation. And especially now where we had to um, collapse. I mean, so many, almost, I heard in a panel discussion in the previous week that we had to, to truncate two years of digital learning into two months. So that's a lot to think about. I worked as a consultant before, so I knew what it was like to work remotely and work from home, but it was also a challenge because the culture was not yet there in a lot of organizations that I collaborated with. I know that everybody on this panel and also listening to this call knows how annoying it is to chase people through emails. But no, when you look at having to go through a process of digital transformation, it's not just adapting to a Zoom call. You're incorporating a lot of task management and productivity software like Slack, like Trello. So I don't have to WhatsApp Kishmar to ask him, how is that video coming along? It's on my Trello board where I'm managing. And, and I think it also, we need to recognize the human and social component and advantage of integrating um, digital in, in our work life where you don't have to be nagging people when you have that trailer board and you're seeing the task moving along and it's the less micromanagement and a flexibility in doing the work so there are those advantages as well and a lot of other things to think about how we move forward in, in that new learning landscape definitely so it, it, based on what you've outlined it seems like if we will constantly be engaged in learning and updating our skills it seems like i mean i thought i would get a one answer but it seems like it's going to be a lifelong process um i know that we have some of the other panelists who who want to make a quick contribution before i go to the next question jovan johnson you you wanted to add to those skills and then i will go to cleon yes Thank you. I wanted to pick up on the point of, of productivity and training and, of course, the, the, the sort of the way in which I think, and it's in some ways in disagreement with some of the comments uh, made earlier, or perhaps even an extension of them, that when we talk about the, the product, boosting productivity, it's as if we know, we figure that once you have the new digital technologies emerging, and then suddenly they are incorporated by businesses, then it should lead to productivity. And that, that's not necessarily the case. In fact, there's a paradox of sort with that when you have new technologies and somehow it is supposed to lead to the technological change, uh, to the uh, output changes or, 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 or positive outputs rather. And I think part of the problem is, and uh, Dana Lynn, I think, um, highlighted some of that very well, the structural changes in society that need to, that need to occur in order to bring most, if not everyone, um, uh, along. I, I, don't, I don't necessarily, and as a result of that, I mean, from my experience just this, just this semester teaching with some of the students, following COVID and the university implemented, um, you know, the, the online teaching, um, teaching, soft teaching mechanisms and so on. I had students who could not come to class or could not stay for the entire two, three hours of class because they, they lacked data the data service or enough data to to allow them to um to stay on class for three hours uh, some of them in, in in parts of jamaica the technology the telecoms the, intel the technological infrastructure is not there and that's a huge investment which brings me to the other point and final point from this intervention the importance of building the ecosystem to allow both businesses and individuals along with other institutions to operate in a way that supposedly to use the economic term economistic term to be productive 
necessarily. And I and I, and I interpret productivity in this sense based on the discussion in a sort of economic sense, you know, so your turnovers, your profits and so on. But productivity broader, how can people uh, feel as if they are part of society, feel as if they're contributing, feel as, feel as if their own sense of development is being facilitated through digital um, through digital transformation and um, and how they're adapting. So if the ecosystem is not right, or if the ecosystem per perpetuates some of the inequalities that society uh, already has, then I imagine the transformations are, the transformations in some sense without serious structural change to break down some of the barriers that keep some out. Mind you, some of the barriers are important for some for some for some of those providers because they benefit from those barriers in place. So there's also that there's also that challenge which has to be overcome. Definitely. So I want to leave some of the challenges for when we get to the policy argument. And quickly, I want to ask Cleon to, to respond to that, the process of learning. Yeah. Um, you know, I said that I oh, was, was way too short for this conversation, you know, because there's so much, right, that, <laughs> that we all can add to it. Um, another aspect of the, of the cultural learning curve that I think is really important has to do with intellectual property. Now, I know that we're going to talk about legislation as it relates to um, data protection and that kind of thing very soon, but intellectual property, um, you know, certainly from 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 an OECS standpoint, um, and in Saint and News, is something that's still quite nascent, right? I myself, from you know, I, I, if I'm out filming and something, you know, I get people say, "Oh, I can't take a picture because." Blah, 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 blah. But but these people don't know that we actually don't have laws that prohibit people taking your picture and putting it out online and that kind of thing. Um, there's there's content being produced much at a much faster rate now. Um, content being produced by by people who are less than professionals, meaning they're not necessarily part of a an established media house. So anybody can pick up their phone. I have a I have a colleague who every morning he does a, a, a live. He's just he's just playing music. He's playing music. And he's just he's just on his Facebook live and he's just ramping and jamming and live and, and all that kind of thing. Is he is he paying anything to the to the to the to the, to the people to the musicians? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Um, so 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 no, it, it's 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 more imperative than it ever was before for us to lobby for stronger um, intellectual property laws, clearer laws, and also to educate the population because if we're all going to be you know, producing media, because I've been asking this question to people, what is a photographer? What is a, what is a cinematographer? What is an editor? What is a photographer? What is a designer? It's everybody. A, a photographer is somebody who has an iPhone, that's all, right? So if we're all now going to be media practitioners, we all now have to learn um, like the legal intricacies of it, because pretty soon I believe that the next, one of the next big media industries is going to be intellectual property. I think it's going to have to be. In fact, in fact, you know, people have been pressuring me to do a master's for years now, and I've just not had the interest. But over the last few months, I'm now thinking, huh, maybe I should do something in media law. Because there's so much media now out there and everybody's producing that I think that we're going to need we're going to need those structures um, from the back end even more. So that was just a quick point I had to make. I have Thank so many you. other points, but I know we all have. have, have a lot yes, of yes, things. yes. <laughs> and uh, I want to bring in because I know that everyone has something to contribute on this topic of learning. Um, I want to ask the next question to uh, Kishmar and Ronaldo, who will be able to answer to add their bits about um, the skills that are needed. So Ronaldo, as somebody who is a recent graduate and animator. Um, your work, Agwe, I loved it. Um, I know that you contributed to that. Um, I want to ask you to describe what this process of digital transformation um, uh, means for us as audiences and users of content. Uh, Cleon just mentioned that almost everyone makes content now. Almost everyone is a filmmaker and animator as well. You can learn those skills yourself and do it. So what does adaptability and digital transformation mean for, for audiences and users? Um, thanks, Alpha. I, I just want to begin with by mentioning when I hear everyone coming out or talking about productivity and working from home and talking about that transformation to bridge that divide that we now are facing with work being in our homes 
And I think one of the things that nobody, or at least I haven't really heard talking about, is the distinction between work life and home life. Because it existed as almost like a mental barrier or mental protection because the stresses of work are a real impact on, on us as people, as creatives and even as non-creatives. That's why you go home to de-stress, to just not think sometimes about everything that's happening and how you need to be productive. And because we are now merging that, that area, these spaces with technology, we, we might actually lose the ability to deregulate how we can protect ourselves mentally because we no one wants to have to be sitting at home all day worrying about work and how am I going to be productive in this moment? How am I going to advance myself? Because that is, that is a very stressing idea to have to almost be constantly be under pressure to produce more and to produce more efficiently. And that is something that we as users, because we're all being brought into this space, whether we want to or not, we're going to have to deal with. Um, another thing that I'm, that I'm thinking of as I'm listening to everyone and I'm talking about how this new space is going to affect us is I remember Dana Lynn talked about starting a podcast and I remember we were talking about everyone or we're going to see a lot more podcasts. We're going to see a lot more digital, um, digital space. We're going to see a lot more people branching out into the marketplace, into these spaces. And it's going to cause um, something actually I learned at Caramac, media fragmentation. We're going to have a lot of new voices seeking out our, our approval. We're going to have an, a lot of niche markets coming out for people who want to try to, to capture that specific audience. And it's going to split our internal views. It's going to split our attention. Um, and as our attention is getting split, it's happening as, as, long, as well as people learning the spaces and just being introduced to the space in itself. So while we have new people branching out, starting up new enterprises, starting up new businesses, um, branching out. You also have people who are coming into the space for the first time. I remember my mom, for example, as a lecturer, never actually was, she wasn't online. She was a very chalk and talk, old school mentality. And that's one of the cultural shifts that, that we haven't addressed because there is going to be, we're going to need time to have the people who weren't in the space to adjust. And part of that adjustment is understanding what content is for you and what content might not necessarily be for you. And with thousands of new content producers appearing, because we are all content producers and we, we all have the capacity to be producers, those who are entering the space for the first time are going to be bombarded with thousands, if not millions of, of people vying for their attention. And as they learn, they might not be able to learn correctly or learn the skills that they need in the amount of time that they need which is going to have is going to add another layer of, of mental stress because my mother was absolutely terrified of, of having to learn this space and being incompetent in this new space and she, and she not having time to prepare and she's looking up all these different resources online for how to be efficient how to be productive and it's it's stressing her out and that is something that we we all have to address we have a, a mental a mental box call it a box that we are that we are in and that and that box is being broken um I'm so happy that you mentioned mental health because in our discussion that's something we haven't i mean i think we need a whole new panel um and another hour to talk about the impact um, so thank you very much for raising that point, Ronaldo. Um, additionally, you mentioned that we're all content creators. And what you raise a point about the concern for quality and the need then for training institutions like ours to continue to play a very important role to equip persons with those skills. Um, but I want you to reflect because I'm going to ask another question about the careers and where we go from here. But let me bring in Kishmar, who's also interested um, in quality productions, because yes, we're all content creators, but what does it mean for, for the quality of what us as consumers and users of content um, have to deal with? Yes, Kishmar, you can unmute. Yes, um, sorry, I was so engrossed by what Ronaldo was saying, again, because uh, before I answer your point, um, 
I, I want to really touch back on the mental health issue because this is something that became very apparent to me very recently as I was forced to work from home um, as an entrepreneur and, and I run my own business um, and we do lots of, of larger projects and oftentimes as a user, as a consumer of content online, the, the rhetoric around entrepreneurship is that you always have to be hustling, you have to be on the go, you have to be on top of your business, you know, um, you can't sleep. And these are very, I mean, I, I understand what, what these people are trying to say and the kind of mentality you must have to be an entrepreneur. Surely you must be hardworking. But sometimes I think people start to think that you can't take breaks as an entrepreneur. You can't unwind. You can't slow down. And that is something that I had to learn being at home. You can't work, you know, 20 hours a day, every day. That's, that's not healthy. That's not helping the, your company. It's actually hurting you because you, you will burn out. You will get. Um, you will get repercussions of that and, and your health will start to suffer for it. So I'm, I'm really glad Ronaldo raised that point and it's something that I want us to all think about. Um, as we consume content um, and, and as an audience of content, we must filter um, what we allow um, ourselves to see. Myself, I had, to, I had to, to stop using my phone very late at night because I found uh, it would be hard for me to fall asleep. And these are things that a lot of people don't openly talk about, but this, this is just stuff that I realized in my own life. And I think that it's important to share these things and let other people know, other entrepreneurs out there who, who are working so hard to get their ideas out that, you know, you don't have to, to always be switched on. You don't always have to work. There has to be space to disconnect and to unwind. Um, apart from that, so to get back to your point in terms of um, quality content, I watched the first part of this series and Stefan Campbell, uh, a lecturer at Karimat, he said something that really stuck with me. And he said, you know, the, the journalist of the future will have to be a context creator and a content curator. And, and that was such a strong point to me because I believe that's where myself as a trained journalist, that, that's how I leverage my skills to, to my clients and my clientele. Um, as opposed to another cinematographer or another photographer, I think my, my ability to understand and contextualize um, broader subject matters and, and put them into simple messages to transmit to audiences is really what has leveraged new visual media um, against other media firms around the region and the way we've seen so much success. So I think as much as the technology makes it very easy to produce content and to shoot something to start a podcast, I think that institutional learning that I, that I got at Carrymac that helps to, to bring a, a broader scope and to really contextualize and, and put things in perspective for the audience. And, and that's the edge that we have. So I want to bring in someone who's very familiar with the lecture from Carrymac, Mr. Stefan Campbell. I want to bring in Christina who was a part of the digital media production program. You wanted to make a point uh, to add to this discussion about users and consumers of content. Okay, yes. I wanted to build off of Kishmar's observation, two of them, the ones that deal with your mental health, although I know that is not the theme that we're focused on right now, but <laughs> Family, um, Pamela made an observation that stated that um, the people from DMP, we are very, which is the digital media production program, we are very uh, unique, I would say, and I do agree because we have very unusual hours. And I want to stress that as somebody who is in the field, and I've been in the field for the last, I want to say, two, three years. What's going on now digitally is not new to a lot of us. We have been on these platforms for a while. We have been on Trello. We have been on Google Suite. We have been using Adobe programs. We've been communicating left, right, center with people. But what's happening now is that as everybody is at home, I am going through a different phenomenon whereby I'm used to working late at night, so I would send work off to people, say, 1 a.m., and I would never expect to get an answer back. And they would answer back. And then I would have about, I would naturally respond because I like to make sure that the people who I work with get what they ask for. And then you would realize that you're going over time, you're clocking in over hours. And then I wonder about the people who are also working at a distance that they need to set up some form of 
self-care routine in which you take a break from these digital devices as well. There is an overuse of a digital device to an extent that we as human beings could be victim to. And I think that that could affect your mental health as well. I also teach students at distance and I teach them digital communication. And I noticed as well for them that they are now over out doing over hours of their schoolwork. And I think that it's important to note that people take breaks from the digital devices as well. And also in working with Stefan Campbell, he did introduce us to the concept of a gatekeeper. And I think that being worried that there, for example, everyone can be a content creator, everybody can take pictures, everybody can take videos, everybody can learn how to use Photoshop on YouTube. You, as somebody who has been educated in the field, we have a different experience in the background. And we also have, we have taken on a different set of skills, which put, puts us on a different level as the people who are coming into the field with less in their backs, on their backpacks, you know? Very interesting. So I think that the gatekeeper is, is you. you. You can be the person who has the knowledge and you can always be one step ahead of the people who are coming in with their new content. And that also has to go work into the systematic and judicial laws. As Cleon had said, like, it needs to go to another level now. Definitely. So I want to bring in Pamela because as we start to speak about uh, each individual being that citizen journalist, being that citizen content creator. You know, it, it makes you wonder where, where do the gatekeepers stand? I mean, well, most definitely there's something called gatekeepers to the internet and the infrastructure. But I want to bring in Pamela to, to share her own opinion about what uh, it means for content uh, users and, and creators. Okay, so when I started working in the medium, it was straight out of sixth form. So, Clearly, I wouldn't have had the education that I currently have now from UWE, so I would have had to learn a lot of it on the spot. And a lot of what everybody here, I, can, I think that we can agree that after you know better, do better. So I started off not knowing much, and some persons trained me and I learned, but as I went to UWE and I learned some more, you start seeing that a lot of these companies think that it is okay for you to hire persons that are not sufficiently trained into something, not train them, and then send them on their merry way, and you expect to have quality products. And it, it, it can almost be the same thing with people who with everybody who is creating content. Yes, we can all create content, but what distinguishes people in the media and communicators and people who have gone to Karamak and to UWE is the quality that we produce because we know better. So when I was at UWE, we had this special course when I did INC and it was a law course specific for you to tell you the things that you can do, the things that you cannot do. And it was very thorough and very informative. And a lot of the times people tell you, oh, you can't do this, which is what I got when I was learning on the field. And then I went to Karamak. And when I went to Karamak, they were like, okay, you can't do this. And these people have done this thing already. And this is what happened to them. Because people do not understand that they're, which brings us back to what Cleon was saying, laws and, be, and policy, because you have to be able to, to tie in being, having some form of policy for what can be done, can't be done, should be done, or should not be done. For instance, I just think that we know better now, so we should do better. And Karamak has given us the avenue to know better. So us as content creators, we have to be able to make sure, as Christina said, that we are the gatekeepers, that we are the one that's making a difference. And to take a little bit from what Stefan has taught me also is that to always share your knowledge. It was shared with me when I started. It was shared when I went to Caramac. And I think that as communicators, if you see 
or if you are aware or if you know just take a little nudge and just explain because some people just don't know any better and us as content creators and people who know better apart from doing better we should be able to share the information for other people to do the same so i like that you have firmly placed a role for the trained media and communication professional even in an environment where uh let's say the gate has been opened and everyone has that ability um to to make content the next question i want to speak about is policy considerations for the changing digital landscape of media and i know we're here from different countries in the region so i would love to hear some of those perspectives uh jovan and cleon started to allude to issues of the infrastructure um, and access that is necessary for citizens to be able to participate in this digital landscape. Um, Cleon also referenced the legislative and the legal framework that would be in place, not only for the, the content creator who can get um, the rights, can get the rewards for their creative endeavor, but also for the distributors, um, the persons who play music without actually paying any royalties to any content creator what does it mean for the media institution now of course this is a very broad question i want to contextualize it in the fact that the european union recently well as about two years ago uh they passed the gdpr general data protection uh, regulations and jamaica followed suits a month ago by passing the data protection act now of course, it's twofold. I, I'm asking, um, and I'll ask Jovan this question to continue where he led off, but I also want to hear from those in St. Kitts, those in Barbados, those in Suriname. I want to get briefly your own take on what are the policy changes that need to happen um, in order for us to, to optimize this digital landscape that we have. Um, Jovan. Yes, uh, thank you. Right. So I'm, I'm happy you mentioned the, the data protection legislation because that's the, that's the latest um, data driven policy uh, that, has, that has appeared on the local landscape here in Jamaica. Um, of course, there were concerns about the legislation, about whether it could be hindering the work of journalists and uh, media and communication workers um, 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 by the Press Association and the Media Association here. Uh, the legislation has gone through with some of the changes. We haven't heard much from the press association or the media association since the new law um, has uh, has been passed. But um, I'm not sure if I'm being heard. All right. So as we wait on as we wait on Jovan, I'm not sure if it's a connection issue, but I'm sure he will have more to contribute. I see Pamela, uh, would you want to, to bring in uh, to this discussion your own context? So as it relates to St. Kitts and Nevis, I know that we do actually have some form of legislation, right? So we also have the Freedom of Information Act 2018. But we, what the, the thing that I found very curious as I was trying to, you know, investigate into policy is that it is, it is catered to pre-digital era. So I think that it needs to be updated and we need to work on being able to facilitate the digital transformation because as some of my colleagues would have said earlier, we have to tie laws, bills to things like mental health because it is a very serious problem and you have to be able to and we don't want to say control because everybody gets so afraid when we start talking about like controlling the media or controlling thought and controlling freedom it's not immediately about that type of control it is about protection protection for the people who are the users so jamaica recently had a data protection bill that was passed and i think that that is brilliant and i think that a lot of caribbean islands can also take heed and 
try to implement those things also because realistically, since everything is digital right now, there is so much information out there and not just random information that you can access for your knowledge. Also, all the time you do business with a company, all your digital information is being requested from you. Okay. So you have to be able to make... Yes. So, sorry about that. I, I want to, to quickly bring in Cleon and Ronaldo will follow on from from Cleon's point. I know Cleon is, is also speaking from that sister isle context of St. Kitts and Nevis. Go ahead, Cleon. Uh, thank you, Alpha. Yeah, so I just kind of want to um, hinge on what Pamela was saying. So yes, yeah, St. Kitts does have a, a data protection act that was passed in 2018. Um, and I think that since, since the passing of that act, um, uh, not enough, but, but a few institutions have been um, utilizing the, the um, uh, sort of provisions in that act. So, so here's something really cool. I, I was able to, to renew my driver's license online uh, last month in St. Kitts. I mean, look at it. You see, like, Pamela is clapping because, because anybody who's had to go to, like, a government institution like that to go renew something that way, you know, it, it, it's a nightmare. You have to you spend the entire day there. Um, and I know that a lot of, in, uh, you know, we've been frustrated in the Caribbean because we're like, you know, we need to have, um, uh, uh, we need to be able to do things online and that kind of stuff. But institutions, they can't really um, take your data and stuff unless they know that there are, are certain protections in place. So we do have those protections in place and there are some government institutions and hopefully more private institutions. St. Kitts right now, St. Kitts and Nevis right now, um, we are in discussions about um, a universal healthcare um, scheme, you know, and that involves things like, you know, uploading your, your health information to a database. And I'm, no, I'm speaking preemptively. This isn't passed into law or anything yet, but these are the talks that we're having. Um, from a policy level. So you go to a doctor and let's say you get into an accident and you get rushed to the hospital. Um, whoever is the nurse or whatever should be able to pull up your information, um, it, you know, through some centralized system, um, obviously having some kind of specialized access and that kind of thing. And it's a very, very, very sensitive thing. And we have to think very carefully about it. But I am kind of, I'm very proud that St. Kitts, you know, has already started you know, has already started those um those um yes. yeah, processes. Because definitely health, it's your own personal data. It's the things that you're doing on these on these networks that you know. Uh, the other day, I was asking one of my software developers, you know, um, asking for a friend, you know, how do you how do you browse privately? Like, how do you truly browse privately? And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, "You you you can't really." Like uh, you, uh, at some point, you know, someone somewhere is going to be able to see what you're doing online, and that's a very scary thing. Sometimes I'm talking, and Siri starts to answer me, and I wasn't talking to her, and she starts she starts listening. You know, you know, I I I, I I've had instances where I just hang up the phone, and I said to a client, "Yeah, man, come by the office tomorrow around nine o'clock," and without touching anything, the second I take the phone away from my from my face. There's a meeting um, request already loaded up in my calendar, and it's just asking for me to confirm. So our phones are listening to us. Our devices are listening to us. Um, you know, uh, uh, the Caribbean, we do, not, we do not produce phones. So, so how, do we, how do we, you know, we are importing these phones. We're importing a lot of these devices from the U.S. Siri is, a, is an American product. Um, how, how are we... How are we um, uh, 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 balancing that kind of connection. How do, how do those laws? Thank speak you for that question. Them? Because you know? as we approach as we approach the end, I know I interrupted Pamela, but we are, we're trying to cover uh, a number of of issues that relate to mental health, that relate to uh, how we learn, how we work, how we function, and how we live. So you're, I mean, you're quite right. And the Cephas and Kitts and Nevis to be making those changes that you're both talking about. It makes me feel quite happy that the Caribbean has the ingredients. And I know that we interrupted uh, 
Jamaica. We interrupted Jovan. Um, I know Ronaldo wants to join in and add something to that discussion. Go ahead, Ronaldo. Um, thank you. I just wanted to, to branch away a bit um, and talk about something that came up in the last couple of years. That's, for, first of all, access is very important because we can have all these conversations about, about the digital transformation and being about how to get access. But if, we, if the entire country of the entire population doesn't have access, which I believe is still the case for Jamaica, then we can make these great strides forward, but people are still going to get left behind. And we need to address the, some of the structural barriers to getting that access. And one of those is something I'm not sure if Jamaica has anything related to in that is net neutrality, because that was a big thing that came up a couple of years ago. Uh, because as we realize in the time of the big C, access to the internet and that type of infrastructure is, is almost essential to how we need to work now. And because in communication and the internet is not a utility, funding and pricing is something that is very important um, as a barrier um, to get people invested and to have people move over into the future. Because net neutrality, um, I'll, I'll give a brief layman summary, is, is essentially um, an act saying that uh, media or, or utility providers of the internet can charge depending on the connection that you're getting. So if you want to pay more, they can give you a better connection. If you, if you want to pay less, then they can give you a worse connection. And it essentially incentivizes larger corporations or larger content providers, content producers, um, larger entities to pay more to internet service providers to get better access, but that limits other people who are trying to enter the space. It limits people who are trying to just begin to get, get their first phone, to get their first internet connection. Because you get that first internet connection and then you realize that you're having to pay extra fees upon extra fees just to be able to act, to get non-dial-up internet. Because dial-up internet was fine decades ago. It's not fine now. We're, we're trying to access content at a rate that is much higher than, than it was before. And that, that conversation about getting access and making sure that everyone has access, everyone has an equal opportunity to that access, is something that we need to have a whole conversation about. Most definitely. And that's a, that, that whole issue of access, I know Jovan was trying to, to build on that point. I don't know if Jovan wants to join in because very soon we're going to go to Barbados to hear what is happening in Barbados, read the policy landscape as we approach the end. Go ahead, Jovan. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm being, okay. Right. I, I know I was talking about the data, the data protection, but I also wanted to add that we have had uh, we have had the what we call the national identification system that largely was um, was dismissed by our courts. But what it what it, what what it highlighted was the issue of uh, data was the issue of privacy and the government's efforts to use data both in national security and in in, in economic purposes as well as to drive e governance uh, e governance processes as well. I think I heard it was Pamela who mentioned uh, about or or, or, Cleon, or Cleon who mentioned about being able to apply for your driver's license without going into the office and 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 the, and the processes that are there. Some of those are 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 likewise on the way here. You can you're able to act, you're able to apply for a birth certificate and other basic processes of government. Not all of them, but some of them without having to go through without having to go um, to go online and of course a lot of this is driven by business interest that you want to you want to you want to speed up the process the, the, the business processes to reduce efficiencies to reduce time all of those things and and, and ensure that people have a better customer experience in respect of uh, things like copyright and intellectual property I think those are some of the areas in which Jamaica and as well as the Caribbean um, must address, if, 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 especially with the with the problems that will be created from data transformation. And one last thing before I before I, I, I ease back to you, is the the lethargy and the lack of progress on in Caricom in advancing the single ICT space. Because a lot of the processes, yes, they can be advanced by national governments. But when you have a, a relatively small region of, I don't know, less than 20 million people or so on, when you, have, when you have a region like that, a region like the CARICOM region, you're able to get over some of the hurdles uh, in a much more efficient way. 
and the government just have to realize I have to I have to find a way to to agree on some on some of these issues to enhance the business processes both for their own economies and their own people definitely thank you for raising that point because i know kishmar is also passionate about this whole concept of the the media the caribbean media policy and ICT framework. So briefly, you can speak to that as well as I want to invite uh, Christina to also shed brief light on what's happening in Suriname. Go ahead, Kishmar. Well, thank you, um, Obika. A um, couple things, uh, just to update everyone, Barbados has implemented the Computer Misuse Act and also the Ele Electronic Transitions Act. We have a, a medical app where you can have your medical information stored on an app and, and regardless of what um, institution you go to, um, you can, all your, your, that physician will be, have access to your medical file. Um, and all these things are great. Um, and I know Barbados is, is, our government is championing the way forward for a lot of new digital transformations um, in the island. But I, I wanna jump to what, um, to what Jovan was saying and this regional approach, because as you know, uh, a regional connectivity and regional collaboration is very important to me. It, um, it is so vital to our survival as the way I see it. Um, and I really think we have to start acting collectively and implementing policy collectively as opposed to doing it in silos in our own small islands. Um, and I, I also want to jump back to one thing um, Cleon said really quickly um, in terms of um, data protection and, and safety and security. Uh, I was talking to my web developer yesterday and I was, we were talking about my server and, you know, using the cloud. And he said, well, the cloud really just means someone else's computer. Uh, you really have no control over that. It's really somewhere else. And in the region, I think we really have to seriously start looking at how safe is our data? How, how safe are we as we transition into digital economies and, and digital uh, landscapes? How, 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 how safe is that data? How, how safe is our connection if, if the internet goes down in Barbados? I know for sure the country almost uh, comes to a halt because so many things are now dependent on technology and dependent on that um, connectivity. And just one final thing um, that I want to mention is uh, digital currencies. Um, I, I think the Caribbean, Barbados, uh, I know for sure, has been making great strides in, in looking at ways to implement digital currency. I, I think Jamaica is as well. But we really need a regional digital currency um, so that we can trade with each other much easier. And for instance, I, I, I currently am doing some business in Jamaica and I want to send some funds to Jamaica. A digital currency will make that so much easier as opposed to having to go through these archaic financial institutions which have not yet adapted to the new digital landscape which many businesses are operating in. So I think when it comes to, to policy on, on digital transformation, we need urgent action, but we also need collaborative action and, and collective um, action where we all can, can contribute to what the future of the digital Caribbean landscape is going to look like. And, and I, 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 I hope that the governments are, are, are looking in that direction and have their minds open in how we can work together to make these things happen because that's the real way forward. Definitely. I'm sure that Mia Motley would listen to you because <laughs> she's proven herself to be quite a forward-thinking regionalist. So yes. I, I definitely... And as chairman of CARICOM. Yes, certainly. So I want to just to complete that cycle of, of regional discussion on policy. I want to briefly hear from Christina. Suriname is a big place. What <laughs> have the policy implications been uh, for digital transformation in Suriname? Okay, so I, before I, I go into um, what the policies mean, I want to just close off and build on what Kishmar said um, about the CARICOM single ICT space. I know that Suriname attended the Futurescape conference in Trinidad, I think, last year. And I think that it is important that it happens because it's not just going to be important for our economies in the Caribbean and for the e-governance systems that are being put in place, but I think it's also going to be good for the media and broadcasting networks across the Caribbean. Because as Cleon had mentioned, when these other media legislative laws come into play, like copyright and intellectual property rights and all of these other broadcasting laws, certain things that are passed as okay, for example, playing 
a movie that you streamed on television, on national television, all of those things that we think are okay, when these laws come into play, we are going to have to have different approaches. And I think that when the CARICOM single ICT space comes into play, we will be able to collaborate and play, interplay with our fellow content creators across the Caribbean to create really well curated, high quality media content that would be able to be played across all of the platforms. But I would say that in Suriname, there is a pressing importance on privacy laws as well, because we don't adhere to the European Union GDPR laws. But shortly after that, there was a law that they tried to pass about the privacy and data protection within our digital, digital landscape, because we are quickly stepping into a digital landscape in Suriname. We have the E electronic identification, personal identification set up in Suriname. And they're also trying to get that integrated into the medical systems. And to protect people's privacy, they did pass a law in December 2018, which was called the Personal Identification Law, to improve the identity security for citizens. And they were going to do this through biometric and electronic technology. And their goal is to improve the electronic monitoring of civilian data so that external parties cannot easily access data and that it is protected within the country as well. And we also passed the digital payment law because the government started, they created something called a money carta, which is money card. And it is a government-issued e-banking card on which they then deposit the money for people who are disabled and people who need to get child support as well. So there is a lot going on in Suriname, but there's more, there needs to be more. It is happening. certainly encouraging to see some of the uh, legislative um, changes that are trying to adapt to the digital environment that, um, of course, will empower citizens in Suriname and other parts of the Caribbean as we strive to empower citizens and also companies to operate within this uh, virtual environment. Um, we're at the end of the discussion, and I know that there's a lot more that could be said. I want to end um, with Dana Lynn. Um, and anyone else I know, Clea and Ronaldo, some of you involved in that education process, I want you to contemplate in about 30 seconds the future of careers in media and communication. I know that's a difficult thing to do, but, but I'm asking Dana Lynn to lead on this as we approach the end. Um, in 30 seconds, the future of media and communication. Well, as practitioners, I think the first thing that we have to do is to stay ahead of the game and leverage the technology. Um, I, 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 Dr. White rings in my ear when he had encouraged us to look about research. And I think even now when we're, when we're talking about the digital landscape, everything is data-driven, insight-driven. And the insight that we get from the data, that's, what's gonna, that's what we're going to use to stay ahead of the game and to inform strategy. All right. I want to ask Ronaldo. Ronaldo, you are in that process of just transitioning into the work environment. Contemplate the future. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, I realized that I remember going on Twitter and hearing this poll done about top five non-essential jobs and how artistry was one of the most non-essential jobs. But then I remember, but then I realized going around that art is what we are using to survive in these times. We have streaming, we have content creation. We're going to see a lot more content producers. We're going to see a lot more content creators. I know providers like Netflix have been doing the most, giving us content that allow us to continually exercise what we want. All right, Kishmar. Unmute your mic, Kishmar. Yes, I'm here, right. Um, my, my last point is I think the future of careers in media will have to be collaborative. Um, it's, it's through collaboration that a lot will get done um, because we will be forced to work remotely um, for the foreseeable future. That, that's just the new normal. So it will, it will have to be collaborative. And like Dana Lynn said, um, platforms like Slack and, and Monday and these other platforms, we're we going to have to become au fait with them if we're going to survive in a new digital landscape in terms of um, creating the career for ourselves. 
Thank you. I want to give the last word to Cleon. Contemplate Cleon. That me, the future of media careers. All right. So four points. One, um, intellectual property. Two, policy development and regulation, especially as it relates to things like ease of doing business, data protection, etc. Um, three, platform development um, for content creation and distribution, currency and collaboration. And four, cultural and human-centered reforms as it relates to things like mental health um, and, and sort of how we relate to each other from a community level. So those are the four sort of things that I think that are the future. I want to thank my wonderful panel of Caribbean brothers and sisters, graduates of Caribac, who took the time out to share your knowledge and experience. This was a wonderful and very engaging panel discussion. I'm certain that the, the audience benefited. Uh, we have had a few questions, and I want to assure the persons who ask the questions that we will field the questions to the panelists and get their responses that we can share with you. I, I want to thank Dr. Nicole Plummer, the Associate Dean of Marketing and Outreach for the Faculty of Humanities and Education for making the Humanities in Action virtual seminar series possible. Thanks are also extended to Dr. Livingston White, the Director of Caramac, Mr. Al McLaren, and the Caramac technical team who worked very hard, as well as Mr. Andre Forbes and Ishmael Preston from the Yui Mona media team who are working very hard behind the scenes. And I must acknowledge the News Talk 93FM team for carrying this event live on their radio station. Thanks in particular to Keisha Power oh. and Frank Lyons for making that possible. A special thank you to you, the audience, for being so attentive and engaging. Just a reminder that this is part two of a three-part series where we discuss adaptability. Next week, Thursday at 2 p.m. Jamaica time, we will feature some industry players, Ruth Lynn Johnson, Conrad Matheson, Melody Kamok Gale, Kiran Maraj, and Damian Mitchell. You are invited to attend this event. Thank you and see you next week.